appear to be recording. Uh, hello uh, and welcome. This is going to be a uh, tour of New Drupal, otherwise known as a bunch of demos and uh, thoughts about future of Drupal. Uh, I tend to work best if I'm unscripted and so that the fact of making a presentation is kind of like uh, not my strong suit. Uh, let me introduce myself first. My name is Chris Weber. I am currently working as a Drupal support manager for Valir. We, uh, we do a lot of work for, for long-term uh, projects, and so I do a lot of thinking about how the work that we're doing can be uh, supported uh, over time, and, and what is the cost of change, and what is the value of change. And, and that, a lot of that thinking has, has impacted uh, this presentation. Uh, before I really get going, I want to talk about the style of this presentation. Uh, it's in the mode of what we would be discussing during our normal uh, midday meetup. We have a midday meetup uh, every month. It is a remote meetup, and it happens during lunchtime. So, you know, have a long lunch once a month. It's not going to kill you. Uh, and uh, we, we get together and we, uh, we do a bunch of demos, we, we do a lot of uh, get to know you, how are you doing, and talk about the, the daily strife of, of working with Drupal and things we can do to improve things, but we also have time for a demo. So what we're going to be experiencing here is kind of like a series of those style of demos where we talk about an idea, but it's also very much one of audience participation. So this is not your normal talk where you wait to the end with all your questions. If you have a question or a thought or an add-on or maybe you have additional information that has yet to be provided, you interject that immediately. Just go ahead, shout it out. That's why I wanted you to sit closer. Turn on the slideshow. No. <laughs> uh, so I uh, recently went to the San Diego Zoo with my family and it was really, really great. The pandas are back uh, and it was super great. So that's kind of also how I'm thinking about this. We're walking around the zoo. We're gonna see a couple exhibits that doesn't necessarily need to be a story connecting them all, but I think by the end you might see one. Um, first up, recipes. We've, in this camp, we've talked a lot about recipes and for good reason. Um, from a Drupal development perspective, one thing that we, we really haven't been talking about it is that we've seen the value of recipes for a very long time. Uh, you may recognize this screen, fellow developers, fellow Drupal adventurers. This is the screen you would be presented when you are creating a feature. What was a feature? A feature was an attempt to ex collect all the things that your feature has, including configuration. Uh, but it also was a module generator. The thing that is produced from a feature is that you would get a module and it would have the ability to be installed and extended. And so configuration was just one part of that story. Uh, I was on a project uh, for a very long time where we used features uh, quite a bit and every one of them started as an export of the configuration and then we wrote all of our hooks into it. It was never going to be uninstalled and that was the problem. Uh, we, uh, we, we took efforts to solve parts of this problem. Uh, part of that was the heroic efforts of building an a entire configuration management system that solved the, uh, the primary reason why features was, was around the, the ability to export configuration that solved that part of the story. Uh, but, uh, and, 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 and configuration could be uh, created in the development environment and deployed to the production environment, like, like Matthew was talking about yesterday, if you went to see that talk. Um, that whole tool chain uh, has saved a lot of grief uh, for, 
first of all, raise your hand. Uh, how many people know what I'm talking about? How many people have used features? Okay. How many people enjoy using features? Okay, that's, that's about right. Uh, Those are all the features fall. <laughs> what was that? I said it wasn't features fall. Features it, took the blame for the absence of that functionality in core. Yep, yep. Features is what we had. Uh, features took the blame for the absence of having uh, of core not providing the ability to export configuration. And once core did provide that uh, uh, features kind of like said, well, what am I doing here? What's, what is even the point? Uh, and to date, there is not a uh, Drupal 10 version of features, nor is to say nothing about uh, Drupal 11, our most recent version of, of Drupal. Uh, and then, uh, okay, and then recipes. So we do want that kind of workflow of features. We want the ability to gather up a set of configuration, and we want to be able to deploy it where we want to deploy it. One of the other kind of workflows of features was that you could export all the configuration of a feature, and it would exist in a module, which would exist in like a folder, and you could zip that folder up, bring it to another project, and install it there, and live with the consequences. Uh, <laughs> It, it, it was, it did provide value. Uh, but again, once you installed that module, it exists for all time in your uh, core.extensions, the, the full list of all modules that are installed, and you had to deal with that. The, 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 the value proposition of recipes is that this will not install. It will be applied, it will be injected. It will be just basically like a grocery list of a recipe ah, <laughs> telling you how to make the, 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 the dish. Um, and so this, what you're seeing in this screenshot right here is the entirety of a feature that exists in core. It is a part of the standard installation profile. It creates the administration role. This is everything that it needs. And it's just one granular bit of a recipe that the standard installation calls upon in order to set itself up. They have already done the work to convert the standard installation profile into a, simply a list of recipes. And so as a developer today, what is the value of a recipe? You need to get into the configuration file and write them yourselves. You need to understand the syntax of them, um, which is a little bit different of a value proposition of features in features, uh, let me jump to that slide again. In this UI, you would simply, you would still need to know a lot about. Like a regular person jumping into this screen would probably be like, this is beyond me. I, this feels dangerous. I don't want to interact with this. Uh, you would have to know a lot about the anatomy of your site's configuration in order to feel confident in using this page. And you would, uh, you would click the little check boxes that are on the right, and then at the bottom you would say export, it would create a whole module, and then you would have to know what to do with it. Um, there are people who are, um, oh, sorry. there are people who are working on a recipe builder, a uh, recipe exporter, and I, I strongly feel that recipes also need a UI. Uh, the ability to give me a good starting point. There are a lot of people who don't want to jump straight into the code. They want to see an example of like, how do I do this right? Tinker my way to a solution. Hey, Chris, are, are you going to be using the slideshow over again in like future sometime? Because recipes only has one eye in it. But you have oh! Recipes. Recipes, yes. You have recipes. Benefit of not jumping into my slides. I do that typo every single time, and I have to correct myself every single time. I like pie. I do too. Um, so, one day, I imagine, there will be this wonderful user experience, this, this workflow of being able to say, I have created a bunch of stuff in my local development site, I want to help my colleague out, 
in getting that installed in their site or I want to help my future self out in trying to redo this functionality for another project in the future. You know, I want to provide guidance to my fellow developers on how to do this right or maybe have that debate. So I want to be able to export my work here and be able to show it off. I want to share. Uh, today, that doesn't exist, but hey, this was a brand new feature in Drupal 10.3, am I right? It's 10.3, it's the difference between 10.3 and the brand new Drupal 11 is the simple removal of a backwards compatibility layer. This happened like this year. We're just getting started with uh, recipes. That's about all I'm gonna say about recipes today. Um, if you wanna get a great talk about recipes, there was one given by Martin uh, yesterday. Recipes, it's about time. I agree, it's about time. Um, actually, there is one more thing that I want to do about recipes, um, but yes, that will come later. Uh, there's this thing called Project Browser, have you heard of this? Yeah. We've been working on it for quite some time. And maybe in the future we'll also have the ability to find recipes within this Project Browser, not just a single module but an entire instruction set on how to use a conglomerate of modules. Imagine, if you will, a commerce Kickstarter recipe or a camp website recipe. Um, all kinds of different scenarios. We've been talking about uh, how to onboard uh, new people and to Drupal and to have the, the whole Starshot uh, experience. We want to be able to provide that specific experience, but what if you wanted to create your own star shot? What if you had uh, like the, the desire to demo Drupal to prospective clients? You could create a demo, client demo recipe that sets up your site really quickly, really easily. Maybe even the salesperson could just run that one command please and, and, and watch, look over their shoulder while they, while they do it, so they do it right. Maybe you don't have to do all the things. Okay, um, before I move on from recipes, I've been speaking for a lot. Um, how many people are excited about recipes? How many people uh, are like, what's the point? Okay, cool. I'm thoroughly excited about recipes as well. Can we talk a little bit about ECA? Yeah. Event, condition, action. How many people have heard about this? ECA? How many people, this is the very first time you've heard anyone throw an acronym at you, ECA? Good, okay, good. Um, all right, one, one more question. Have you ever heard of a module in the elder days well, I, that I call like the, the Drupal 7 and older days called rules? Have you heard of this module? Yeah, so ECA, event, condition, action, is intended to to allow you to build custom functionality in your Drupal website. Um, have you heard of uh, Yahoo Pipelines? Yes. Yeah? yeah, Yahoo Pipelines. Yes, Yahoo Pipelines. Uh, it was awesome. Many people think it was awesome. I, I, I never really got into the flow with that. But yes, you can do a ton of things with Pipelines. You take this little thing, you connect it to this other thing, and then it outputs a thing that you want. It's magic. <laughs> uh, believe it or not, uh, our current website is using ECA. Uh, and now you realize the reason why I didn't uh, jump into presentation mode. Uh, and this is what they look like. You get a nice little flowchart of the logic of the thing. Every circle is a condition. And then the, uh, I mean, uh, is, is an event. And then the other things are the uh, conditions and the actions. So we start with a, hey, my event is the, uh, the, the session content type is being updated. And let me, let me see if I can, I don't think I can zoom in. Oh, I can, look at that. I'm just using the uh, oh, motion to zoom in. Uh, and then uh, we take a look at, to see if there's any uh, new values. Every 
square that you have creates its own kind of like API of how it's going to communicate with the other ones. It creates tokens, passes those tokens into the, the next step of the, of the flow. And then in the end, we decide, has the session been accepted or has the session been rejected based upon the value that a content administrator would, would set on that talk. And then it decides which it, 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 it accesses the email message that it wants to send out to either accepted or rejected talks, and then it will actually send those emails. Question? Is that flowchart itself also a feature of ECA? Or ECA? It is. Well, I mean, OK, we're getting pedantic here. Uh, so ECA uh, itself is all the plumbing on how to get the flowchart to work. And the flowchart is this library called BPMN. Uh, business planning M, I don't know. What that <laughs> By the way, uh, acronyms are the worst invention <laughs> we have ever created as a humankind. Uh, <laughs> LOL. If you, if you use, pronounce it as a word, it's an acronym, but if you say the individual letters, it's an initial. Yes. Pedantry. <laughs> this is what I rely upon you, Steve. Thank you very much. Uh, but for, for the record, uh, if you pronounce it, it's an acronym. But if you yes. use it, it's an initialism. If you say the individual letters, it's an initialism. So ECA is an acronym. Yeah. If we called it ECA, then it would be an acronym. Shutters. 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 So the, the cool thing about, from, from a I, and, and if I haven't said it yet, or if you haven't detected, I'm a developer, and so I, I simply cannot take this hat off. I cannot, in the way that I'm speaking to you, and the way that I'm describing things, it is possible for me to get out of my perspective as a developer. This is how I see all these things. But as a developer, when I look at this, I think, oh, isn't that nice? It's a nice workflow. Perhaps I could have a means of explaining what this is doing outside of the context of speaking to other developers. If I'm in a presentation, with my stakeholders, and I'm trying to explain what this is doing, they can see a nice flow chart, and they can get it. You seem to have replaced Google, uh, Apache Airflow with uh, something that's built right into to Drupal. I'm glad you brought that up. There are, there are so many tools that are also approaching the complicated challenge of describing a series of logical processes with code, and instead, they are trying to provide a graphical user interface that shows conceptually what it is doing there. And, and Airflow being an ETL tool that deals with complicated extractions, transformations, and, and loading into external sources is the perfect ground for that. Um, I'm going to not follow that thread because I will talk for the next half hour on how I would like to change the migrate system using ECA. And I'll just leave that there. Uh, but instead, uh, what I want to do is demo number two. Um, so this whole workflow that we saw was exists, is stored, is, is kept track of by Drupal with configuration. Um, and what did we just talk about as a great way of deploying configuration? Recipes. Recipes. <laughs> Thank you. That's, I'm never going to live that down. Uh, so the people who create ECA know about this, and they have already created a library of existing ECA processes that you can bring in. And uh, I went ahead and I did that. So. Here is one that I've imported while I was listening uh, to John speak. And uh, so this is a nice, simple one. I wanted to find a simple one that I could show because a lot of these uh, flowcharts can be super complicated. But who wants to fly by the seat of their pants? <laughs> All right. So let's just pick one. Uh, calculated entity field. So. In your project, you would just execute this command. Uh, and 
Let me bring up the one that I need to do it in. So you would have a single composer command, and the composer command should know about all the root dependencies of the recipe. So if it has additional modules that you don't have, that the recipe depends upon, it's going to bring those in too. It's going to bring in everything you need for the recipe to work. Uh, the problem is, is that if it did bring in any new uh, modules, Drupal doesn't know about it yet, so you need to clear your cache, as you do with most things in Drupal. Do a thing, you're probably going to be clearing your cache. And, and now it would know about any kind of new things. If we refer to this uh, guidance that it gives, uh, I have filed an issue to fix this. This is completely wrong. Uh, instead, you would use a uh, drush command. And I've got it here. And I'm just going to modify it for the one that I brought in, which is 22. There we go. It just did it. What does that recipe look like? It loaded the recipe into this folder, and it's going to install a bunch of modules. Don't pay attention to this. It thinks it's a JSON file. It's not. It's a YAML file. Come on. Uh, the only thing that this command would, would, would do, in addition to importing the configuration, is install these modules, which were already on. Okay, so I've executed this command. Let's go back to the uh, Drupal site and find it. Over here in configuration, we go down to workflow for ECA, and here we are. And what is it doing? Something simple. Got it. It's going to have an event of uh, pre-save a carpet content type, it looks like. And then it's going to calculate a field, a field width. It's going to provide the token to the next one called area. And then it's going to store that area into a field named field area. So that means if I look at my structure, if I go to my content types, no, not comment types, content types. Ah, there is a carpet. And there is a field width and a field area. So, I did not have that content type at the beginning of this presentation, and now I do. So that is the value. If you and your team start using ECA, then you'll be able to take your features that you build and export them as recipes, have a central repository of solutions that you can pull in for any project, and once they install, you don't have the legacy of having to support that feature, the, the, the mechanism of importing that into your site. You would just have the legacy of this is where we started, and now for my project, I can deviate from that starting point without having to impact any other project. I'm, I'm hard of hearing, I'm sorry. Do you have multiple recipes working on the same content type? Can she have Oh! Uh, um, so, there, there might be the chance of some kind of conflict, but if there were, it's the last recipe imported that wins. So, if you had two recipes and they are both importing, if the conflict was something like, this one wants to create the content type, but this one also wants to create the content type, I don't imagine you were reacting. Uh, I, I don't imagine a show-stopping conflict because the, the recipe would say, oh, it's already created. But I wanted to add an additional field. Okay, well, I can go ahead and do that. Yeah. Any other? Yes? So, this was a recipe you just imported. Yeah. You could do it through Composer. But that would, like, throw that in your composer.json, right? Yeah. Kind of make it permanent. But the point of a recipe, right, is that it's just... It's applied, not installed, right? Right. Um, so you ran a drush command instead. That is that is applying that recipe different in those two different mechanisms where, versus doing composer require versus that drush command? So the, in, in both of the cases that you're describing, composer require was run. 
And so, yes, the composer required legacy is still there, but it's Martin is about to interject. Uh, this, is, this is our current reality. We have to make sure that if the recipe is the one that it was responsible for bringing in new modules or something like that, you have to, as a developer, jump in and take over that responsibility from the recipe and put it into the composer require section so that if you were to remove the recipe in the future, that it wouldn't also remove the dependencies you're, you are now dependent upon. Yep. Anything else to add, Mark? Yeah, so there's a thing in recipes called unpacking. So the idea being that like after you apply a recipe, you can unpack the dependencies to automatically do what yeah. you're talking about. Have that added to your sites like was about JSON. And then at that point, you can compose or remove the recipe. Got it. Okay. Yeah. For the record, Martin said the, the process is called unpacking, and perhaps it's more than just making sure that the models are present, but also, you know, unpacking the responsibilities of the recipe. I imagine, I'd say this, we're in science fiction time, that we're talking about a, a far-flung future of perhaps a year from now, uh, that there would be a uh, recipe unpack command, and you could give that command the, the recipe that you want to unpack. And the command does that responsibility for you. Because I imagine any kind of manual process that you have to do over and over again that could be problematic is ripe for automation. And you can just do that, uh, maybe. Or, or maybe Project Browser could do that automatically. Or maybe Project Browser could do that automatically. Yeah. So this is what we have now, and again, so new. Uh, and just like we've built on top of all these foundational structures that we've added to Drupal, adding recipes to Drupal is just the beginning of, of what we'll be able to do. See, we ended up talking about recipes and now ECA is bringing recipes back. Uh, back to the presentation. Uh, so, uh, yes. I, I was about to also say that. Uh, Project Browser, future recipe installer for ECA processes. Maybe there could be an ECA channel or something like that for, for really cool stuff you want to bring into your project. Wouldn't that be kind of cool? Just spitballing. There have been a lot of talks about ECA. Uh, at Dr the last DrupalCon, here's a camp mid-camp uh, session about ECA that was particularly good. Martin, uh, uh, Jurgen, the, uh, the lead developer of ECA, has given a number of talks and is likely going to give another talk at Barcelona, if I, if I remember correctly. So, if you want to learn more about uh, this whole new cool thing that seems to be gaining a lot of momentum, uh, you, can, you can follow up on that. Let's move on. Uh, so, oh, Wilbur. Can I just get a temperature in the room? How many people are using ECA on production websites? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, now there's interesting, right? Yeah. Production. I said production. Yeah. There you go. There's an expert. There's an expert. All right. And we are using that. it on our camp website to send out emails. That's why it was a replacement of rules. Yeah. Thank you. And also, thank you to the uh, Drupal Camp Florida folks, which we. Uh, <laughs> We copied our, our whole website last year on, on their code base, and they, they were the ones that pioneered that work. We did literally no work on the ECA part. <laughs> we, spent, we spent 10 hours and got a new website. Yeah, yeah. Which is great for camps. Uh, so, you, how many people have heard about this experience builder thing? That, that the Drupal folks are working on. A lot of folks, I, I knew you guys were raising your hands, but what, nobody over here is, have you ever heard of Experience Builder? Uh, yesterday's keynote, Preston gave a, a really great talk about what he was calling a universal CMS, and, but he was also in that presentation talking about this, this hybrid area where uh, CMSs like Drupal are trying to build a, uh, a build uh, and in the way that it was originally described to me, it's like this is our attempt to compete with the square spaces of the world uh, to try to provide a content building experience. How many people have heard of Layout Builder? Yeah. Let's call that try number one. 
<laughs> a lot of, lot of effort, a lot of great thought, a lot of thinking about laying out pages, a lot of evolution from the stuff that we saw in the early days of Drupal. How many people have heard of panels? Yeah, it's a natural, natural evolution from, from all that work. And, uh, um, and we'll get to my, my other question uh, later. So um, I was going to spend a lot of my time in this talk here. Uh, and I was working really hard to try to get a cool demo set up. Then yesterday, uh, somebody built that for me. Uh, and I would want to just be able to go on over here and start playing this here. This is uh, Kristen Paul. She is currently working on the uh, demo design system. And in order to prepare for a presentation they're about to give in Barcelona, they wanted to build out a series of components that could be used with Experience Builder. And by the way, this is Experience Builder. And be able to demonstrate the, the value and, and, and the, the efficiency of building a landing page with the components inside that, that Experience Builder can detect. And so at the very beginning of the presentation, for just like a split second, because I'm running this at two times speed, they were showing what they're trying to build, this, this really big kind of like uh, markety page that describes the value of Drupal 11. And in it, she's using components. A component is interesting because you are at the ability to provide to, do, to declare what parts of the component a user is going to interact with. Question already? No, it's just you can actually see a referring back to a reference image every few minutes. Yeah, that's right. So a component has the ability to say, well, I want, to, I want the ability to define what the, the headline text is. But maybe I don't need to define the width of that picture that's on the right. You know. And, but also, maybe I want the ability to say, in my component, I've got a number of things figured out as far as like really simple questions about, I want this field, that field, but also I want to provide an area in the component where somebody can add whatever they're going to add in that, what we call a slot. You know, like if we're going to we have a reserve a placeholder in the component. And so when we think about this, we think of all of our attempts to create components in the past. Paragraphs. How many people have used paragraphs in the past? Yeah. How many people have used blocks in lieu of paragraphs? How many people have used the other one? Bricks. <laughs> yeah? Uh, clearly there's a, there's, a, there's a desire and there's a demand to, to be breaking up the complexity of a page into smaller bits. Um, <coughs> So as this runs, is there any immediate thoughts, any immediate questions that come to your head? Yeah? My, as a, also a WordPress developer, is this Drupal's Gutenberg moment? <laughs> this is not Drupal's Gutenberg moment, because yeah. Drupal's Gutenberg moment was the moment we brought Gutenberg into Drupal. That was my next question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it, if, if you look at this, and if it, the people who raised their hands when they said they, they've seen a uh, layout builder in the past, this is basically layout builder, but let me pause here for a second. Oh, maybe not there. Uh, then let get over to the right, Kristen. There you go. Perfect. So right now, what Kristen is doing is she's. Whoop. Let's let's back up a little bit. Okay, I'm just going to pause right there. Um, and you know what? Uh, let me uh, just jump to this. Uh, here we go. Here's Layout Builder. Um, I actually did get the demo working. <laughs> um, and so this is, the, this is the default kind of like, this is the components they add to the Experience Builder that they use to test with to see if they're working. But I just want to point something out here. We see this bar at the top here that says Desktop. If we scroll on over to the right, what, what Kristen was doing at the very end of it, you actually see Mobile. You're able to, to, to make a change 
and then be able to see that change reflected in both the desktop and the mobile perspectives. And so, and actually, here, let me see if I can, yeah, I can zoom out a little bit so you can see them both. Isn't that great? Yeah. So, you want to be able to see how this page is going to be rendering in multiple, multi-modals, multiple perspectives. And so, we got there. And if we were to click on a specific component, we're able to modify the, the settings of that. Right now it says, hello world. We could say, hello Twin Cities. And be able to see, just, just mock up your, your content that way and be able to keep that view in multiple perspectives. That's the value add here. But you know, one other thing I have to point out, just super nerdy detail, notice, the URL, it is a Drupal URL. But notice what this looks like. Where's the rest? Where's my header? Where's my menu bar? This is a 100% JavaScript application. This is built in React, written in TypeScript. It's launching, it's running off of your Drupal website. But the way that it's interacting with your Drupal website is 100% data layer. It is communicating to all of the APIs we've been spending all this time building so that you can access and manipulate the data. Uh, I, I should say it, it will. If I try to publish this, it says it's not supported yet. Uh, but they're, you know, they want to be able to iterate. Every week, this functionality is advancing. There is a team that is actively working on this and they're making great progress. You can follow along. If uh, you search for Wim Lears, an experience builder, he has a nice little week-by-week uh, play-by-play. Question? Uh, so that's a page. And then is it later that, or before you start this experience building that you decide where in the hierarchy or its URL of that page? Um, or that question seems to be like, can you, like, Next to yes, could could you define the route of the page? Is that is that the question? Yes. I don't think we're there yet. Okay. <laughs> right now, uh, the reason why this page exists is because I was able to create an article, and I created it as as normal. You don't see any kind of like weirdness here. Uh, but once it's saved, uh, there's a bunch of like hard coded stuff in order to make sure that it, it's working. That would make specifically articles be able to be launched in the experience builder perspective. Okay. One other question I'm gonna to get to a, a next and a yes and. Oh okay. Um, also I didn't mean to imply that uh, this is like a one to one for Gutenberg or anything like that. Right, right. Um, are, is this relate to single directory components at all? Or it does. Thank you for the lead in. Okay, perfect. <laughs> uh, if if I were to just go ahead and, and click on a thing like like Kristen did. Uh, and be able to say, I want to add a grid component. Uh, that's not good. Yeah. Something, something cool. Well, well notice, notice that as I hover over things, sometimes I get this weird little preview thing. There goes my hero. Another hero. <laughs> the thing that I just added is a component. A single directory component. And if you were to create components, then there is a module called components that will search throughout your site and find every component that you have written that, is, that has been registered, that could be discovered as being uh, a component. And that was the, the page that I had up. So these are all the components that the site has found and uh, has made available to the experience builder, this one called Shoe Badge, another one called Image, here's the My Hero one. Um, right now it's just, here's a list of your components that I found, and, you know, it's not, this is not a very helpful page. Uh, but you do have the ability to say, I, I want to turn that component off, uh, which I have not tested, and I don't want to break in front of you and embarrass myself. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, as a developer, while you're working on a theme, uh, so here's the Experience Builder code base, and let's track down the module. Here it is. It's got this folder 
named components. It, by the way, is this too small for everybody? Can you see this? Good. Well, well some people know, some people yes. I can't increase the size of the font on the left, but I can increase the size of the font on the right. We'll, we'll get there. Let me just open one. Here's the My Hero, and here is the file that matters. This is the, uh, this is the uh, uh, component file. This is what tells the system that I am a component. Okay, I'm sorry for folks that when you, whenever you see it, YAML, you are like, well, what the heck? Uh, but the, the basic idea here is that developers are learning how to write these. Developers are learning the, the schema of this file, in fact, the entire definition of everything that is legal in this, uh, in this file is right here. If you go to this URL, you'll see what is allowed and what is not allowed. And if you have a, a, a nerdy developer on your staff and uh, that is willing to jump into the sea of JSON schema, uh, everything's there. there. There are no mysteries. Uh, but the, 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 the key artifacts here is this one. Uh, this props, properties defines the anatomy of your component. Uh, it has a heading, it has a subheading, it has a CTA1, href, h2, and uh, other attributes. And so, uh, these are, this is the way that the component talks to Experience Builder. And you saw that left, that right hand side panel that showed all the fields and what you can modify. This is how the component tells Experience Builder, here are all the editable things. And it also is a way of telling the template, here are all the things that I care about. And so when you're creating the Twig template, you say, okay, well here's those attributes. Here's the heading, subheading, CTA 1 and 2. So you are telling two audiences, the Experience Builder component registry system and your front end system, what variables do I have available? Um, and the value of that is that you only have to do the work once. And then it's, it's, it's available in both places. So again, imagine the far flung future where you have imported a theme or you inherited a theme or you downloaded a theme and that theme has done the work for you of defining all the components that it thinks that you would want to use whenever you're laying out sites. And, and then as a content creator who doesn't want to care anything about anything I've just talked about this entire time, I just want to lay out a freaking page, you're able to take your well-known, well-used components off the shelf drop them in, and have confidence that you're going to be able to lay out the page properly because as you are laying out that page, you get a nice preview of what it's going to look at like, not just in the context of the desktop, but also in mobile. I imagine in the future that it's not just going to be desktop, it's going to be tablet, it's going to be widescreen, it's going to be small screen, uh, and maybe some, oh wait, I can zoom out here. Uh, maybe some, some even fancier things like what Preston was talking about, like show me, the, show me how this looks like in all text, or like, show me how this looks like in an RSS feed. Kiosk. Kiosk. Yeah. yeah. So again, this is like yesterday. Yesterday they were building this thing. This is the demo that they made yesterday. <laughs> so, a lot of progress is being made. Stay tuned to DrupalCon Bar Barcelona. Um, I would like to end this presentation checking on time. Wow, okay. There's a chance for me yet. Uh, to talk about one other thing. Uh, I've been joking with uh, Wilbur that when I'm looking at Experience Builder, it reminds me of something. Um, it reminds me of Acquia Site Studio. Acquia Site Studio looks like this, and this might have echoes of Gutenberg too, where instead of being a standalone JavaScript application, this is an embedded application. This is in your page, and you're able to have a shelf of components that you want to drop in, and, well, that's not a, let me get rid of that one, maybe not that one. Uh, accordion uh, slider, uh, okay. These are the default uh, components you would bring. Let me just bring in a text. Good, nice single, 
component. And then when you double click on the component, the component has a nice little area where you provide more detail and stuff like that. Uh, but the, the interesting thing about this is that it's, it's an implementation detail. Uh, all these components are extremely complex. And you can go into any one of these components, so let me do this, uh, take this text section, and I can click on configure, and then I can extend here within the context of a UI, not within the context of writing a component YAML file, within the context of the UI, I can extend the definition of what a component is. I can go here in the form builder and I could say, well, I want to add another field. No, field. Field group, whatever. I can add some. And now um, I've converted the text editor's uh, list of fields that are available to add in uh, a field group. And then I can go and uh, add things into the field group. So. Um, where am I going with this? I think I'm just basically trying to say, uh, one, there have been a lot of need for some kind of like visual layout builder for a very long time. There have been a number of attempts at this outside and inside of Drupal. We have been listening to and, and, and trying out new ideas for a long bit of time. And, uh, we, we have been finding out what works and what doesn't. Uh, we need your perspective to know that we're going to land in the proper place. So um, as the demos become available, as your developers have access to launching these things, as things become more real and things that you can work with, we need you to take a shot, start using them, providing feedback, and your feature requests. Maybe in six months. All right, I'm going to end it here because I do have three minutes left and I didn't really provide a, enough space for any kind of question. Go. Can you tell the difference between, I've used Paragraph Layout Builder as uh -huh. a Layout Builder. Yeah. But what I found, or what my team found was better for that was being able to reference views, you know, integrate solar and have other options with that. Is that out of, it seemed like with the paragraph builder, it took away some of the user's ability to do it because that was good for us because now we control how it looks. So the question is, um, is there going to be a similar evolution yeah. with experience like builder? Is there going to be an evolution with the paragraph layout builder where it's going to be more of the kind of drag and drop that you showed as opposed to us building it in the back end like you would paragraphs, but it's just kind of like. When I think about the future, of Experience Builder, I don't imagine a future with Experience Builder that includes paragraphs, yeah. because the the purpose of the, the value of paragraphs is replaced by the value of components. Yeah, I just look at val I look at paragraphs as components. I'm just yeah. building those myself as opposed to having them available. Right now, there is no similar uh, developer experience with components where you could like click your way into yeah. making a component. Um, but I do imagine that once we have Experience Builder and we've got a whole bunch of components, that that need of make, keep, could I just have the process of making a component be simpler, please, uh, be present. And yeah. we'll have to figure that out. Wilbur. Uh, we've all been at this, well, a bunch of us have been at this for a long time. And we have paragraphs on seven. And We've done a bunch of migrations, and probably a lot, a lot of us pulled a lot of our hair out doing those migrations of various things. Uh, when yeah. we think about paragraph, or the experience here, whatever we are calling this thing, uh, doesn't that make us shudder a little bit to think about ah. doing migrations yes. in the future? Or, How? Or are we confident enough that we are on 11, 12, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and that will never have to do a major Let me, let me just, so let me, let me rephrase. Uh, how would, how do we imagine the migration process of going from paragraphs to something that works with Experience Builder? 
Would that be a good way of rephrasing? Or we're building we're building now the websites we might have to migrate in the future. Yeah, we're today we are building websites. This brand new thing is coming in, kind of looks like the same old proposition. I'm gonna have to spend a lot of effort, a lot of time upgrading things. Um, that's another reason why I wanted to do this talk because there is a different kind of model. The model you're talking about is can I run a migration and transfer the data about a paragraph from this to that. Um, so what I imagine is this. Uh, the paragraph is using a template it is a good time now to try to embrace and extend the existing paragraph. If you can create a component that is doing exactly what your paragraph's template is doing, but instead of doing it in what it, the, the, the template that it's currently doing, it's, it uses the component in order to render out. You can take those at outputs of the paragraph and just populate it into the properties of the component. Once you do that, then you're also telling your future site how to be that paragraph. And so the only problem that you'll face in the future is like how you migrate the data of all the paragraphs you create. But when it comes to creating, reproducing pages that look exactly like how they looked like in the past when they used paragraphs, you'll be able to solve that problem and you can do it today. Mark. I just wanted to, to add to that. I've heard some discussion that, that at some point, Experience Builder could support both paragraphs and blocks to make it an easier transition to sites that already have a lot of like an ecosystem basically built around those yeah. technologies. So optimistically, like it may not be like version one or you know what I mean, but like yeah. that's sort of yeah. potentially on the roadmap. The other thing too, in terms of that idea of migrations, I feel like since Drupal 8, the whole concept, the paradigm has shifted to let's build Drupal 9 in Drupal 8 and let's build Drupal 10 in Drupal 9 so that you don't have that sort of like one significant like, yeah. oh my god, we have to like basically create a migration yeah. and do all that stuff. So like, and we'll go to you like, yeah, like the last really onerous migration that you had to do yeah. between Drupal yeah. major versions is in the past. The, the, the yes and uh, <laughs> on top of uh, what Mark was saying is that the nature of, ex of Experience Builder is to not interact with Drupal through PHP code, through entity lookups, it's to access, access Drupal through data APIs. And so even with paragraphs, there are endpoints, there are JSON API data APIs that, that could be used in order to access paragraph data. So I can certainly imagine in the future some kind of means of directly accessing that paragraph information. Kind of touching on this, the, so these components you're defining, you're defining these single directory components that are using this experience builder. How, how are those? How are those, what are those components as far as like in Drupal data structure? How are they stored? Like, how is the data from those stored? Uh, how is the data of a single directory component stored? Yeah. The single directory component is not a paragraph. It is not a block. It doesn't have a data layer. It is a new kind of renderable, like uh, like a field or like a block. It's it's it is, or or like a like a table, you know. Like if you were if you were writing custom code and you say, uh, what is the what is the uh, the type of this? You could say the type is component. Um, if I had time, I would jump into the work that I did with single page preview, where I, I did this myself, and uh, I'll show you this after the talk. Okay. Right. Another possible interpretation of this question is like when you add a hero component to your page and you populate the title of the hero and the content of it, yeah. how does that, where is that, where is that data? <laughs> yeah, that's what it feels like. Right. That you put into the component for that. Right. It's, it's stored with uh, the, the page layout of Experience Builder, but it also contains the list of all the different components that are stored. Um, I, don't, I, I definitely don't have time to jump into like what is the tire, what, how does the, the layout on an Experience Builder is stored, but they're, they're working on trying to create this JSON object that defines the layout of the page and 
when it is rendered on the front end, it would use that in order to populate. It's exactly what Site Studio does as well, and that, that's what I would show you. Okay. Yeah. I think, I think we're all trying to think about this just to figure out, well, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking like, how are you gonna migrate? Yeah. yeah. The reason why I was trying to think about that same question of like, how, right. how state stores and how- Clearly that's going to be an issue. Unconference. It's time for unconference? Oh yeah, let's unconference that idea. Let's 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 uh, export that question into the <laughs> unconference. All right. Any other rude remarks, comments? Okay. Thank you much. <laughs>